Hi, welcome. Um, I'm Tom Tyholt. I'm a member of the congregation. And uh, if you are a member of the congregation, you have the great coffee table book about the congregation, its history, and the incredible Warner murals uh, inside the main sanctuary. I wrote that book, so I know something about the murals, uh, which I'm going to talk about today. Um, just to give you a little bit of background um, to appreciate the context, Wilshire Boulevard Temple um, was organized as a congregation in 1862. And in 1872, they built their first synagogue on what was then called Fourth Street in Los Angeles, which is Second Street in Broadway. There is a restaurant um, downtown called Redbird and uh, that's in a former church. And the temple's location was pretty much directly across the street. That was the first location. In 1896, the temple needed to expand and built a second temple, a new temple, on 9th Street and Hope. Um, that temple um, also um, in time became too small uh, to hold the entire congregation for the High Holy Days. Um, in 1915, Rabbi Egder Magnin became an associate rabbi of Wilshire Boulevard. Uh, rabbi Simon Hecht was the senior rabbi. Uh, rabbi Hecht passed away in 1925. And by then, uh, Rabbi Magnin, he wanted to have decoration inside the sanctuary. And what he wanted to do was create images that would educate and inform. Uh, this is the 1920s. And a good deal of Wilshire Boulevard's uh, congregation were people who were in the nascent uh, movie industry. And they were keenly aware of the way in which images were telling stories and how our culture was increasingly an image-driven culture. Wilshire Boulevard Temple um, was built very much like a movie palace. The stage is raised, the floor is uh, raked. There are unobstructed views from both the, what in the theater you would call the orchestra and the balcony. And there are decorations. To do these decorations, Warner Brothers, and in fact, the actual Warner Brothers of Warner Brothers, loaned the head of their art department, Hugo Ballon, who spent about a year working on these uh, images, first in his studio in Pacific Palisades, and then installing them in the temple. Um, and they were, at the time of the renovation several years ago, they were restored to their current uh, beautiful state. Um, there are three lunettes, which are these triangular or half moon shaped tableau, one of which is directly above the bima, uh, way up high. There's also one on the eastern side and one on the western side. And then there is uh, what's called the frieze or the scroll of Jewish history, which is the images that run along the interior of the sanctuary. Let me start by discussing the three lunettes. The first uh, central lunette above the uh, bima that you look at when you are uh, in temple, uh, staring straight ahead and looking up, tells the story of creation. Hugo Bellin, who was um, uh, of German Jewish heritage, spent his time being both a muralist and uh, running the art department at Warner Brothers. He used all the techniques that he had at his disposal of how to catch our attention, keep our attention, uh, highlight, and he kept it fresh using different styles. So if you look at the central lunette, uh, going from left to right, we begin in darkness, and then in the center, we have sort of the ferment of creation, the 
uh, animal life coming uh, from up above, we see the power of creation, the godly energy, if you will, uh, shining down on all creation. And then as we get to the right, we see um, the first woman, Eve, unformed in the process of being formed. And we see the first man, Adam, um, lying there. Um, one can assume that his rib has been taken to form Eve. To the eastern side, um, there is the lunette, which tells of the rabbis and sages and prophets of old. In the center at the top is Moses, who is conveyed as a larger than life figure. His eyes are closed and his face is lifeless because his life's work is done. He has already uh, left this earth, um, but he has given us uh, God's law. Beneath him is Aaron, his brother, who was the, the priest. Um, and you will see that Aaron is making the Kohanic priestly blessing, which some of you may also recognize as the uh, Mr. Spock's Vulcan Star Trek greeting, which comes from this uh, Kohanic tradition. So to Aaron's left is Ezra. Ezra um, is really important because at the time of the Babylonian exile, there was some question about whether Judaism would perish. Um, until then, Judaism had been practiced as a religion in the great temple in Jerusalem, and one had to go to Jerusalem to the temple, and the high priest performed the ceremonies there. Ezra read the Torah to the people, and in doing so, he basically decentralized the Jewish religion and made it possible for Judaism to be worshipped wherever Jews gather. Ezra is next to Hillel, um, the great sage. Uh, above him is Hosea, who uh, preached uh, salvation through repentance, uh, which is certainly appropriate for today, Yom Kippur. There's also Judah Hanasi, um, who compiled the Mishnah, the oral tradition. Uh, there's Ezekiel, who prophesied the destruction, but also the building of a new temple. And Isaiah, who prayed for the peace um, we still hope will come. So that's all in the Eastern Lunette. That's sort of a collection of some of the greatest um, thinkers of early Judaism. Now, the Western Lunette represents the Messianic Age. And there, from left to right, we have Micah. And Micah um, was someone who emphasized the importance of learning to Judaism. And so he's reading a tablet. And um, I'm going to point out that many of us today read a tablet. And so uh, in that way, human nature is the same. And our, our um, appetite for reading and learning um, by looking at a tablet remains the same. There are images from Isaiah uh, of the city on the hill, uh, the great temple. Um, and if you look at the very top, you'll see this notion of the lion lying down with the lamb. And then there is water being turned into oil and shields beaten into plowshares when uh, there is no longer war. These three lunettes can be seen as representing our journey on this earth. We are born unformed. During our lifetime, we are filled with learning, tempered by uh, Mosaic law. Uh, we have our hopes and dreams before we arrive at peace. Uh, those are the phases of any congregant's life, and they are portrayed quite beautifully in these three lunettes. If you remember on the Bima, on the right, there's sort of what looks like green marble. On that green marble are the words which begin Genesis. When God was about to create heaven and earth, the earth was a chaos, unformed, and on the chaotic water's face, there was darkness. Then God's spirit glided over the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. And there was light, and God saw that it was good. The first section portrays uh, the period from Abraham to the first temple. Abraham 
is portrayed pouring water to welcome the stranger. Again, this is one of the first examples of the extent to which Judaism is all about the stranger, empathy for others, caring for others. Before there's even a written uh, law, it is one of the first commands that Abraham fulfilled. At his feet, there is dust, which symbolizes the dust of migration, Abraham having crossed the Euphrates River to the promised land of Israel. Next to him is his grandson, Jacob, the root from which the 12 tribes sprung. Next to him, we see in a completely different artistic style being portrayed the oppression of Egyptian slavery the muscled forearm of an overseer who is holding a whip, and we see the prostate Jews uh, beneath him. We also see Jewish babies drowning in the river, and we see Moses being placed in the basket in the river. Now, next to it, we see a depiction of Moses. Moses receiving the word of God. Um, I will point out that this is 1929, and it, to me, it's quite interesting because if you look at this Moses, he looks like an aged Superman about to uh, leap into the air, and this is nine or ten years before uh, two Jewish kids in Ohio will write the first Superman comic. So whether it's prescient or uh, just something that they shared in their common heritage and way of thinking, I think it's interesting to look at this depiction of Moses as uh, the first Jewish superhero. We then see the plagues, uh, the Jews fleeing the Red Sea, falling upon the chariots of the Egyptians. We see the Ten Commandments, and behind them are clouds and lightning. The next illustration um, is of Joseph. Joseph and his troops bringing down the walls of Jericho. Samson tearing down the temple. Saul between two oxen. And then there's King David. And King David is pictured in late age. Now, if you look right next to King David, there's kind of a medallion. And in that medallion, there's a little sort of image of him uh, taking down Goliath. King David is looking off to a temple. And that is the temple that he wanted to build, but that won't be built in his lifetime. It is the temple that Solomon will build. So that takes us from Abraham to the first temple. The next series of images over the three arches have to do with the sacred books of Judaism. Psalms, which were possibly originally written to be sung and performed uh, in the great temple in Jerusalem. Proverbs, which include includes the famous um, writing Writings about a woman of valor who's pictured here working a loom and offering drinks to a thirsty man. Again, an act of kindness. And there is Ecclesiastes, which is the expression of an old man whose spirit is broken. And finally, the Song of Songs, which is perhaps one of the greatest love poems ever written. These four books provide a contrast of faith, spirituality, charity, even feminism, old age, pessimism, bitterness, and love, and the romantic love and carnal love between a man and a woman. And Rabbi Magnan had a very strong belief that life is a combination of all these things and that religion must meet it at each of these phases to enhance our lives as a source of comfort and inspiration from the east spandrels to the back wall. What we have portrayed here are the wars of Israel and Judah. This is a period of biblical history that many of us may not be familiar with. It pretty much covers the 9th century before the Common Era to the 11th century before the Common Era. It's after King Solomon, his son, Jeroboam, was not accepted as the ruler of all Israel and Israel splintered into kingdoms, the kingdom of Judah, the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Samaria, and Israel waged war among each other and also with their neighbors, the Philistines, the Moabites, and others. In these panels, we see King Omri. Omri was a general who became the king of Samaria. Uh, he's sitting there in his red regal gown. Next to him, is Eliyahu Hatishbi. Now, Eliyahu, this Eliyahu, you may know from the Passover Seder. 
He's the person that we open the door for and leave a cup of wine. Eliyahu uh, was known for having been fed by ravens when he was in the wilderness and starving, and also for going to a woman's home whose son was deathly ill and, depending on your interpretation, curing the son or bringing him back to life. Uh, next to him is the prophet Amos. Now, Amos is staring at a giant Assyrian head, and this represents the time during which the Jews came under Assyrian rule. Next to him in the little circle there are Haggai and Zechariah, who are in that medallion. And they were both uh, members of the great synagogue who, through their scholarship, kept Judaism alive and vital. And they continued to spread the knowledge of Judaism uh, during the period between the prophets and the sages. Then we see an Egyptian head, a menorah, and a Greek head. So this is the period of the Greek and Roman wars. This is the period of the Maccabees, when Jews were fighting against Jews and also fought with the Greeks and then the Romans. If you look at the wall all the way to the right there, you'll see the letters S and P. Now, it's quite interesting because what's missing and what originally must have been there are the letters Q and R, S-P-Q-R, which stands for Senatus Populusque Romanus, the people in the Senate of Rome. That represented Roman government, Roman might. And there's a wolf there in the corner, which is a signal of the bad times to come for Jews under the Roman. I think this is also, uh, in some ways, a tribute to Jonathan ben Zakkai, who during the period of the Maccabees kept alive the reading and study of Torah and believed there was a way for all Jews to acknowledge each other and embrace each other, uh, regardless of our individual or group observance differences. And uh, Jonathan ben Zakkai is a spirit that was recently referenced in a incredible speech on the Knesset floor where a new member of parliament, who's a religious woman, was speaking to her Knesset members not to fight with each other, but to unite for the greater good, which is a lesson we can all hear these days. The south wall, the back wall now, is the wall of the matriarch. Pictured there are Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. Now, the style of this ornamentation is very much like Art Deco or Art Nouveau of that time. And they're really presented, because they're above us there on the lintel, as on a pedestal, as women we admire. What I think is so interesting is that when we sit in temple in the sanctuary and we're praying, those four matriarchs, they have our back, literally. And when we leave the sanctuary, we look up at them and look up to them, uh, knowing that their beneficence shines down on us and that they look out for us. I think Balin and Rabbi Magnan intended it as such. And the West Wall takes us from the Roman era to the Middle Ages. Now, this is the period that you may all recognize from the story of Masada, when the Romans uh, laid siege to Jerusalem. Now, how do we really know the story of Masada? How do we know uh, that these things occurred? Well, it is because not everyone died on Masada. Not all the Jews died on Masada. One of them, in particular, Josephus, hid in a cistern. And we see that pictured here. Josephus would go on to defect to the Romans or come under their dominion and would become a historian who wrote what is called the Jewish wars, the history of the battles and the stories we now read of Masada. Josephus is in the urn. We see the Roman battering arm. We see Titus, who was then a general, uh, who was the conqueror of Jerusalem, and his capture um, as his loot or plunder, the giant golden menorah of the great temple, which he took back to Rome. And if you go to Rome today, you can see this same scene on Titus's arch, very much like it's uh, painted here. That takes us through the Roman era. 
the Jews were under great torture and difficulty in Roman times. We have portrayed here the great sage Rabbi Akiva. We see him being tortured. And there is Hanina and Hananinaim, the two ways, uh, who taught Torah against the orders of the Romans and who was, as a punishment, set aflame at a stake, surrounded by a Torah scroll. And the legend has it that as the flames were rising, one of Hanina his students asked him, Master, what do you see? And he replied, I see the parchment burning while the letters of the law soar upward. And I think that's quite an image to think about. To his right are Rabbi Meir and his wife, both of whom were important scholars. Rabbi Meir is known almost as the Jewish Aesop for his children's tales. And uh, Beruria was known as one of the great sages Torah scholars of her time. The next panel features two of the greatest uh, Torah scholars that we reference today, uh, Rashi, the scribe, and the Rambam, Maimonides. Rashi lived in France where he actually worked uh, harvesting wine and uh, lived uh, long enough, unfortunately, to see the Crusades and the torture and murder of Jews and we have Maimonides, the Rambam, who uh, left uh, Cordoba, Spain, and traveled uh, first to Palestine, and then eventually settled in Cairo, where he became one of the heads of the Jewish community and physician to the Egyptian court. And uh, the Rambam it was quite well known for his um, advocacy of rationality and how Judaism could be a religion that was not in conflict with Christianity or Islam. Now, over the three arches there, the spandrels on the west, we have a illustration of uh, the Jewish holiday. First, we have Yom Kippur, where Jews are repenting and atoning. Uh, next, we have Rosh Hashanah, and we see the shofar being blown. Next, we see a Seder. And finally, we see a celebration of the Sabbath. And the a Sabbath is being celebrated by a virtuous woman who is lighting the candles. And the model for this virtuous woman was Ruth Dubin. Rabbi Dubin was the associate rabbi to Rabbi Magnan um, and a long-serving rabbi at Wilshire Boulevard Temple. And his wife, Ruth, modeled for that image. These four different Jewish events are part of the life cycle of Jewish celebration and remembrance that bind our people from ancient times to this day. Today, we are observing the same holiday that was observed thousands of years ago by those pictured in the scroll of history. The last panel takes us from the Middle Ages to America. Now, the first image we see here is of Emmanuel of Rome. He was, in the Middle Ages, a very well-known poet and writer um, who wrote poems that were appreciated not only by Jewish citizens, but also by all Italians. He is reading his poems to Dante. There is a legend that Emmanuel read his poems to Dante, and Dante, hearing them, was inspired to write the Divine Comedy. Um, there you have that, that uh, story of Emmanuel of Rome. Magnan still wanted to convey the influence of Jews on Muslim culture. And so he portrays three scholars. In many ways, these represent the ways in which learning benefited all mankind. Uh, the next image is quite, um, quite unusual because we have a murderous spirit riding a sort of dragon that's breathing fire. Uh, this was Hugo Ballin's interpretation of the Inquisition and of the wrath that rained down upon uh, Jews during this period and that forced them to flee their homes from Spain to uh, Germany and Poland uh, and other countries, and that would eventually drive them to the U.S., these paintings were done in 1929. So in 1929, the pogroms, they were quite fresh, and the waves of immigration 
coming to the shores of the United States was also quite fresh. It was obviously before the Holocaust and the founding of the state of Israel, but it was a time when many, Rabbi Magnin included, saw America as uh, the greatest home for uh, Jews that ever was or will be. So we see the procession of Jews carrying their Torahs, uh, making their way towards uh, perhaps it's a more modern future. It's clear that the arrival in America was the start of the kind of glory for Judaism Rabbi Magnin certainly imagined that uh, Wilshire Boulevard Temple would be home to. So that takes you through Jewish history from Abraham to uh, America, from creation to the Messianic age. And uh, once again, I hope that this has um, at the very least <laughs> distracted you from the long day and uh, possibly given you things to think about and uh, inspired you. Thanks. And uh, again, this is Tom Tyholtz. I do a weekly chat with Rabbi Susan Nanis called Culture Mavens, where we talk about what to watch online. And on September 30th, uh, I'll be your book maven in a conversation with novelist uh, Nessa Rappaport. Again, a meaningful fast and a good and happy and productive um, and better new year. A good year. Thanks.